Um, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Danielle Moore. We have a, a dedicated communications agency, so that means we do marketing, PR, advertising, but all of our clients are in the agricultural space. So we live it, breathe it, love it, and uh, get a bit obsessed by it every now and then as well. Effective communication for agribusiness in connected society is a massive topic. I'm going to skim the top, um, but if you have any further questions later, please grab me. Uh, but it's, it's some observations, I guess, from spending 15 years or so, particularly looking at some issues that are playing out. Um, everyone's, uh, everyone's had a, a good dose of some media this week. So uh, we'll have a look at that and, uh, and then some insights into why agriculture, there's, there's some characteristics around agriculture and also the people that make up agribusinesses that um, sometimes make it difficult to work out why our messages may not land. So to start with, we have the premise, of course, that for communication to be effective, the message has to land. What that means is that the, the, the person who you're talking to or the organisation or the group, they listen, they absorb and they understand the message. Uh, I have been in meetings where people have said, I've communicated. And I've said, how? I sent an email. That's not really effective communication. Um, and the way that agribusiness is at the moment, there's societal shifts uh, that have taken, in many, many cases, decades, but they're what we're experiencing at the moment. Uh, and they're having an impact on how well agribusiness can communicate in what is a very connected society now. We have metrocentricity, which I didn't know was a word or not, but I'm making it up now. Um, and uh, it means that, that we often have decision makers in, um, in policy or in regulation, which, which is there as well, increased regulation, that are more removed or, or, or separated from rural and farming audiences. Um, they may not always be making decisions that are fully informed and where the full impact of those decisions or the long-term impact in particular may not be well understood or well considered. This then flows into some of the social licence uh, to operate pressures um, where we're seeing you know, resistances or lack of understanding around new technologies or challenges to traditional practices. Um, it plays out in a space where agriculture as a lifestyle, as well as a livelihood, is a slightly unique position for a sector. So there's not many other sectors where your home is also your place of work, other than, I guess, if you're maybe someone who's working from home in their, in their bedroom. Um, you, you have a very personal relationship um, as an agribusiness um, people within agriculture, which is, a, is, is quite unique um, across um, sectors. There's a characteristic as well that comes with that that I think is around um, uh, the, the nature of the people who are drawn to agriculture and agribusiness tend to be the doers. They like to get things done as opposed to commentate or observe. And that comes, is playing out in, in some of the differences that we see, I think, in uh, people who are commenting on uh, agriculture and agribusiness versus the people who actually do the doing within the sector. And everyone has an opinion. Um, food is very personal. And whether that's food, fibre or fuel, it all gets muddled up. Um, and this is all then compounded by being in a, uh, an environment where uh, information is very immediately available uh, and it can be very uh, easily filtered for good or for bad. Um, the impression can be that these things are sometimes happening to us rather than with us and how do we make sure that we've got a voice at the table um, when there's so many players and there's so many different ways that people are getting their information uh, and, uh, and how, do, how do we actually cut through, I think was the, the comment from Caroline earlier. This is borne out in its worst forms, I guess I could say, uh, in what we've seen in the last... Monday this week, anyone who had to get into Melbourne CBD um, was, uh, was very uh, upset. Um, but it's not just, I guess, the veganism, although <laughs> I don't know who their um, communication advisors are, but I don't know if they've actually achieved what they hoped. 
Uh, we've got Greenpeace with the GM um, issue, uh, anti-GM, anti-GMOs. Um, we've got um, small businesses being affected. We've got large organisations that's, that are CSIRO uh, in the, the middle one there in 2011. Um, we've got um, fertiliser runoff into the Great Barrier Reef, which plays into other industries potentially as well. We've got Aussie farms mapping um, people's homes which they say they're mapping farms, but this comes back to the, the your farm being your home. Um, there's also um, f uh, free range versus organic, the debates around that. You've got the live meat export, and then it plays out in other sectors like health and anti-vaccination um, movement as well. This can be really confronting um, for agriculture and agribusinesses. It's, it's, it's personal, even when you're in a large organisation. I used to um, be in communications at New Farm, um, so you can still be an internationally listed public, you know, uh, corporation, and it's it's still quite personal. Um, so it, it's hard to know. Do I respond? When do I respond? Do you know how? What what do I do? Um, there are some reasons, I guess, and, and this is coming into some um, into some research and data, which is is a little bit contrary, and I realise ironic talking about responding to emotional issues with, with information. But there are some idiosyncrasies that go with agriculture or agribusiness against the people who are, are, are maybe protesting our actions that can explain why, as an industry, we sometimes find it hard to uh, find the messages that are going to resonate and that cut through. So a logical response to an emotional concern does not work. And probably the most uh, well-known example of this would be Monsanto's experience with GM, um, starting sort of 15, even 20 years ago, where there were concerns about a new technology and the, the only, or well, the main response was to, simply to throw data and evidence. Um, I've worked with some of the guys who started this process um, from Germany and they say now that that was a mistake. They didn't realise why it wouldn't work. Um, their logic, though, is not completely their own fault. As technical experts in organisations, um, there's been some research done. This, this is research done by uh, Pew in the US. Um, there's a several others as well that show that if you're a technical expert, and in this instance it was engineers, scientists and me medical professionals, your view of what is logical, rational and likely to resonate is actually very different to everyone else's. So if you're on a continuum, and the, the top one there is actually around um, GM, I'll make this available afterwards, but the top one is safe to eat genetically modified foods. It, it, it is done in 2014, but there's more recent research as well, which, which hasn't changed much. And it says that as a scientist, if I'm pro-GM and I think that the way that I communicate should resonate, and it's not, there's a clear reason why. There's 51 basis point gap there. So this is, a, this is one of the insights, I guess, as to why when we say... These are the messages that we need to communicate. They might not land as we expect. It ultimately means that we're not the norm within, within agribusiness. We're generally leading it in an agribusiness or in, in a, as individual farmers, we're technical experts. We know our craft. We're engineers. We're scientists. We are um, a detailed people. Uh, and we uh, are, are logical and methodical. It's a gross generalisation, but I only have 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> and you'll see there that uh, this, uh, even, even then, it was, it was three, three or four of those topics are what we, we really are facing in this last week or two as well. So we've got genetically modified food, um, uh, pesticide use, um, glyphosate issues, um, and vaccines. So I don't know whether it's encouraging or discouraging to know that these were around um, in 2014 as well. This is some additional research um, in, in similar areas that, that shows that there's a natural tendency or there's going to be a safe place for people in our industry to want to, to be 
when we talk about messaging and we talk about communication. Um, this, uh, so the Pew is obviously the US. This paper here was also done in the US, um, Washington and South Carolina <laughs> universities. Uh, and the one in the bottom here was the Royal Society of, in the UK. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a tendency to deliver information. It comes back to, um, in many ways, the reasons that people are attracted to these kinds of jobs, they're kind of logical, they have process involved, um, and it's also the way that we're educated. So we're educated to be methodical, to write things down and to, to stick to the story. Um, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a characteristic of our industry that can sometimes make it hard to work out how to communicate with, with non-industry participants. We see this play out in our agency, even with clients, where um, websites are structured based on organisational structure, not on how someone would want to read the information. Um, we have had instances, and, uh, and this was the bane of my life for a while, where um, all of this, the seed agronomists, and there's none in this room at this stage, um, would want to uh, put a table, a data table, into a press ad. I'm not saying the data is wrong, but it's not really the easiest way to sell a message. So we can contrast this with some other research, which has been done by Philip Fernback, who is an assistant professor of marketing at uh, the University of Colorado. He's also written a book called um, The Knowledge Illusion. I like, just might let that sink in for a moment. Because to us, <laughs> we want to argue the point. Um, and the problem is we're arguing with people who don't know that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. This was focused on genetic modification as a question, but it plays out in other sectors where there's a, you know, a strong opposition to a new technology or a new idea. Uh, and those that are very, very at the extreme end will find it very hard to, uh, to um, find a middle ground. I have gone over my 10 minutes, I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, so, knowing all of that, when we see this play out, there's a natural tendency, um, partly because we're playing by slightly different rules as well, as businesses as opposed to individuals, we have a certain responsibility around governance and accuracy and truth. <coughs> the temptation is to, you know, jump either jump into action, so that's tactics, you know, get onto Facebook, get onto Twitter, do whatever you do, but don't really understand exactly how that hangs together. Um, you feel pressure to respond or react when that may not be required. Um, give in to demands, like handing over three lambs at, a, at an abattoir, um, or find another way of working or, or go to ground. There are some challenges with all of that, given that, that we, we, we can't just hide. Um, so there's some ways to think about responding that helps with the question of, you know, should we, how do we, where do we, and when do we? So when we're thinking about the audiences or the potential breadth of the audience, the bell curve is my friend. Um, and it, it basically says that when you're thinking about how to approach these things, you look at what I call, hopefully, the sensible middle. On the far extreme, you'll have the people who are anti, regardless, but they believe they know everything. It's kind of the irrational side. Then on this side, you've got the advocates, the people who are always going to believe no matter what, and they're often some of us. In making a decision about whether to act or uh, and where to act and how to act, we really do encourage, and we, we, I've employed this myself, encourage people to think more about the middle and try not to worry too much about the extremes. The extremes are very loud, or can be, particularly you know, in, the, in light of Monday's events. But in a practical way, your time, resources and energy are not going to be useful at that end. You're just going to end up discouraged. Uh, and banging your head against a brick wall. In that middle area is where you'll find your decision makers, your influencers, the general public, and then within that area you work out um, how, how and where to play. I think, Will, you mentioned earlier that collective marketing, I see this as also um, 
collective representation. There's a lot of collective representation opportunity in this space, and that's people like uh, Grain Producers South Australia, all of those other representative bodies, and, and they should be employed and they should be utilised and encouraged as a way for an industry, sections of industry, to respond without actually having to put your hand up yourself um, and, and uh, <laughs> put your head above the parapet. Having said all of that, what's been interesting and in what's played out uh, earlier this week is that there has been a, um, a shift, and I've seen it in the GM space, watching the media for 15 years in that area. Things that used to get headlines 15 years ago don't get headlines mm. now, particularly in GM and in these areas as well, because there's no new arguments and it's becoming uh, the same story every day. And I, I know there's frustration with the media not reporting things accurately, but it's getting slightly better in, in my humble opinion. Um, you've even got activists like Mark Linus, who was the founder of Greenpeace, saying that he got it wrong on GM. I do like the tweet on the, on the far side where he was saying he was going to have a vegetarian lunch, but deliberately went and got a steak. So when making decisions around all of this, and there's no practical, I haven't given you any practical tips on all of this, just a lot of theory, it does come back, though, to your core basics around communication. So your business strategy should drive your communication strategies, and there needs to be a strategy. It can't just be a bunch of tactics, a grab bag, and that then drives your selection of tactics. Um, ensure that your messages focus on the benefits that are valued by that target audience, and that requires a little bit of stakeholder engagement and stakeholder analysis. It's a little bit like um, the te ag tech startup guys getting on a tractor with a farmer. That's a good way to find out what the audience really wants. That is then delivered by your product features that is backed by your technical evidence. A lot of agri, and particularly R&D-based organisations, will tend to try and do it the other way. And that, in my experience, is why you end up feeling like you're on a bit of a treadmill. Thank you. <laughs>